We have had a wonderful morning. We have been very inspired, right? Okay. And so we're ready to continue the conversation over lunch. First of all, before we uh, give a blessing for the food, let me just take this opportunity to thank the gentleman who helped put this program together. Howard Dow is somewhere at the door. Brent Taken is, I believe, had to leave. He prepared a wonderful video. So for those of you who were not here earlier, we shall make that available on YouTube. And those who were here can tell you it was great. And uh, Paul Dabry is somewhere right there. Thank you very much. Let me thank the gentlemen who um, represented their companies in the morning discussion. Bill Russell, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Okay, he might be outside. Patrick Sheffy, both of them are from Bell State. And uh, James Brown, right there next to Dr. Dabry there. And of course, Jake Jorosad. Where are you, Jake? He's out there. Okay. Businessmen, they still have to run the show even when they're at a conference. Just to say thank you to all of them for hanging out with us this morning and um, really sharing their experiences around this question of uh, engaging faith and work and hopefully humanizing the places we call home for eight or more hours a day. All right, so now I'm going to call my good friend Eric. Okay, you better can see him. Eric works at Oak Grove, and he will give the invocation so that we can have lunch. Thank you, Faith. Good morning. I thought I'd do something a little bit different today. Uh, I have uh, four children, all six and under, and uh, show and tell is kind of a big deal around my house. So I thought I'd bring something for show and tell today. And I'll explain it here in a, in a moment, but uh, it's, been a, it's always a fun journey to uh, look into our faith, and I think that's what today has been about, and that's been fun for me. But this week I got a special treat uh, while well, putting my children to bed, which, you know, at times feels like a hostage negotiation with four of them, you know, give you anything you want, just go to bed. Um, but this week was it was kind of different. We had a we had a nice night, and I was uh, tucking my uh, my oldest son into bed. He's a he's five years old, and he goes to Oak Grove Lutheran School. And he uh, he took this little piece of paper out. And you can see he's got his hand traced on here, and there's some stickers, and then he's got some little stamps on the back with folded hands. And I asked him, I said, "What you know? What is this, Max?" And he says, "Well, Dad, we made these in school today, and these are to help us to remember to pray." So I want to I want to pray tonight, Dad. I want to make sure we remember to pray. And I said, okay. And so we we knelt down at his bed together, and uh, for the first time probably in his life, my little five-year-old had a personal conversation, just him and his maker. And uh, that was pretty special for me. And as I sat there with my eyes closed while he prayed, I just kept saying, thank you, God. Thank you for being a God who meets us where we're at, when we're at, how we're at, how we are, and uh, for these opportunities that we have to seek him. And uh, that's what I appreciate about Concordia College. It's what I appreciate about the Lorentzian luncheons, is that uh, we get to come together as adults and seek him, seek him through conversation, seek him through how he uh, fits into our daily lives. And so I'm just so thankful for that. So uh, I hope that uh, you have received some of that this morning, and I know over lunch you'll, you'll get some of that too. So uh, please pray with me. Lord, we're so thankful for today. Thank you for this time of fellowship together, together, for taking us as we are, and for opportunities to better seek you and seek a relationship with you. Bless this food before us. 
Bless the hands that prepared it. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. I want to invite our very good friend of Concordia College and Lawrence Center for Faith and Work and a very good friend of mine, Mr. Howard Dow, to in introduce to us our common friend, David Miller. I'm not going to do a roast of David. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Second Timothy two says the Lord's is the microphone working? The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. Perhaps an even stronger statement of this thought is found in Luke 6. After Jesus talks about loving our enemies, the passage goes on to say that if we want to be like our Father in heaven, he is kind to the wicked and the ungrateful. <clears throat> David Miller is one of the kindest people I know, and that quality is the second quality listed in 1 Corinthians 13 in describing love. Love is patient and kind. <clears throat> I often have heard the expression that dogs <coughs> can tell whether a human is kind or not, that children can tell whether an adult is kind or not. I take that a step further. I think all people can really tell whether somebody's kind or not. It's a great tragedy in our world today that so many serious Christians are looked at as very unkind and angry and all the other things. And uh, we are to be light to this world and I don't know anybody <clears throat> that lives out that uh, kindness and light any better than David. Uh, I've had the privilege of being with David in Moscow and various other places and sitting around with uh, eight leading Russian business people and one, uh, I'll call him a mini oligarch, he's a very, very prominent, wealthy Russian. And after David made his presentation, he basically looked at David and said, what you've said gives me hope for the future. And uh, I know he sends David a special gift every <coughs> Christmas because uh, he, he was touched by who David is, what he does, and, and how he does it. So my privilege to in introduce David Miller. I forgot to say he is the leader of the Faith and Work Initiative at Princeton University. So. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Howard. That is the, uh, if you'll pardon the pun, the kindest introduction I think I've ever had. And I can only think that my mother must have scripted that and sent it to you. <laughs> She did. From heaven. <laughs> uh, no, I very seriously, uh, Howard and I enjoy a very special friendship for uh, a good 15 years or so, and I, I cherish that, and, and your words mean a lot to me, so I, I thank you, Howard. Um, I also, uh, however untrue it may be that what you said, I also want to, of course, thank the, the dean and thank uh, uh, Faith uh, for her amazing work at the Lorenzen Center for Faith and Work. I think it was about four years ago that I had the privilege of being out here when the center was being launched and sharing some remarks with the community. Uh, and it's a, a delight to be back here again uh, among many friends. And Dr. Dover, thank you also for your interest and support of this vitally important area. Uh, any business program uh, who has something like what's going on here is, is incredibly blessed. Maybe you want to do <laughs> Needs a little Viagra here. What's going on? 
That's just a joke now. That's, come on now. So let's see. Uh, so moving right along. Can you hear me? How's this? Does this work all right? Craig, are we okay? Do you need this on for your rec You do need it on. All right. We'll try our best. Tell you what. Give me a moment. How does this work? This, how are we here? A little, little better? All right. Well. So in discussing what to, to think about, uh, Faith and I came up with the topic of uh, faith at work, and I don't mean Professor Gunjiri, I mean the, the wider topic of faith. And, and listen carefully also as we go on how I describe faith. Uh, I think, uh, Jake, you may find some of it interesting in light of what I heard you uh, talked about some in, in the breakout, uh, uh, breakout panels. Um, uh, a, a few caveats, by the way. I, I approach this subject as both an observer, uh, as a student of the movement, uh, but also as a former senior executive. So I look at it uh, from an experiential or phenomenological perspective. What does it mean to try to live out in one's faith at work and, and as an individual and organizationally, but also how do we study it, think about it, observe it, theorize about it, and try to improve it. So I hope to uh, learn from you today, and we'll have a little time, I think, for a question and answer at the end and uh, uh, see, see where this goes. Hopefully this will be in line with what we do with Concordia's mission. The mission, the purpose of Concordia College, as most of you in the room probably know, is to, quote, influence the affairs of the world by sending into society thoughtful and informed men and women dedicated to Christian life. That's an extraordinary mission statement. To influence the affairs of the world, not to retreat into the sanctity of the church or a nonprofit, but to be out in the world getting our hands dirty, and to be thoughtful and informed as we try to dedicate a Christian life. Uh, and the Lorenzen Center says its mission is it identifies and sustains ethical values and practices in individuals and organizations. So hopefully what we do will we'll complement some of that during uh, my remarks. Uh, so I, I'd like to start with this, the, this whole question of faith and work. Uh, uh, many people think that the Wall Street Journal and the Bible really have nothing to do with each other. And, and frankly, for many years, I, I thought the same thing, that never the, the twain shall meet. I had a wonderfully compartmentalized world and life. Uh, but as I, as I got a little bit older, I began to realize that was a false dichotomy that I was making. That indeed, the, the scriptures, whatever tradition you're from, and I'll be speaking uh, out of the Christian tradition today in my remarks, but whatever tradition you're from, and certainly the Christian tradition, that book, that text, both testaments, is really all about the story of life and how we engage in life and our various occupations. So I see the Wall Street Journal very much as not a separate or detached book, but it, it's also the story of life, our fallen life as we live it, and that the Bible can be a set of train tracks or parameters or principles or guidelines as a way to think about integrating faith and work. And to be sure, anyone who tells you that it's easy, they're trying to sell you something. It's, it's not uh, platitudes, it's a, it's a earthy, rich, and vibrant struggle full of failures and occasional successes. So uh, let me start by apologizing for the PowerPoints. And if it's all right, I'm going to take my jacket off. It's a little warm up here. So you've all probably been PowerPointed to death. Hopefully this uh, uh, you won't feel tortured by what we're about to do. Uh, briefly, just a word on, on my, my work at, at Princeton. So this is what my version of the Faith and Work Center does, uh, not too far distant to what Faith and Jury is doing here at the Lorenzen Center. We're conducting research into this intersection of faith and work, and then trying to develop practical resources for, particularly I'm focused on leadership, is the space I look at. My theory is that if you can impact leadership, you can impact the rest of an organization, both at an individual and an organizational level. Also, let me comment to say that, that words matter. And notice it doesn't say the Christian faith. Uh, I, I teach and work at a secular research university. I can, I can make zero assumptions about who's sitting in my class when I teach or people that I work with. And I'm sure that's increasingly the case with many of you, Jake, I think one of the points that you were making. So I look at faith, I consider faith a worldview. 100% of the population, 100% of the people you work with have faith. It may not be faith in Jesus Christ. It may be faith 
in Moses, it may be faith in Muhammad, it may be faith in only in that which they can see and measure. So maybe an agnostic, maybe an atheist. But everyone has faith, everyone has the worldview. I study in particular, I focus on the three Abrahamic traditions, and I ask the question, what does Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have to do with the marketplace? And the answer is an awful lot, even though we may not hear it from the pulpit that often. And what I'll hope to do is say, well, do they really belong together? That's the underlying question. The Wall Street Journal of the Bible. Do these two things belong together? Are they opposing forces and just going to wreak havoc in our workplace? Should faith be privatized? Or, in fact, could they be complementary resources? So uh, here are the tablets and stone of what we'll try to accomplish uh, and talk about. Uh, what, what do we mean by faith and work? I'd like to take a couple minutes in that, the context of the workplace that uh, we all are working in these days, and then look at the two different arguments of conflicting forces or complementary resources. So what do we mean by faith and work? As I mentioned, first of all, it's multiple traditions I think we need to think about with integrity and honesty and authenticity, <coughs> only one's own faith tradition, absolutely. I'm not suggesting that be diluted. But also, how do we navigate and respect and understand traditions that are different from ours. And what does it actually mean to integrate faith and work? Well, for some people, it's it's finding meaning and purpose. When they talk about bringing their faith to work, that work should have value. And maybe even, as, as Luther would say, a vocatio, a vocation, a vocation, something that is of a higher order, a higher purpose. So you're not just making something, but you're building something to help make the world a better place. And finding your place and calling is a huge thing. And many of you know, we've talked a lot about millennials, how do we attract and retain millennials, what are the challenges and the joys that this generation is bringing to the marketplace. This thing is forefront in many of their minds. When I first started working, I didn't think about work as a calling. I was just trying to make a good luck and get ahead. And as I got older, and I think many people don't want to wait until they're older, they're asking the question, how can I find meaning and purpose in what I do? And by the way, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have an elite job. You have to be at the top of the pyramid, or you have to be doing just sophisticated knowledge work. That meaning and purpose can exist in routine, mundane tasks. And frankly, it's one of my critiques of my fellow academics who often are very elitist, and they think of themselves as progressive and liberal. In fact, it's often very repressive. And the assumption is that honest hard work is not a powerful and important thing, and you should be included with the dignity. So one other thing, think about sanctifying work. Does anyone know what this is? This is the uh, Mill Stock Exchange. A priest, every day when it's open, the priest offers a blessing. Now that might conflict our sensibilities, and I get that, but it's a highly Catholic uh, country, and that's what they do there. And whether they'll continue to do it, who knows? But a sense of watching communion or the Eucharist go on in the stock exchange just jars all sorts of images, doesn't it? <coughs> Part of me finds that really, really wonderful. What an anchor, what a, what a grounding as you begin trading for the day to remind you of things bigger than yourself. And on the other hand, wow, does that really belong there? It's, uh, it's an interesting one. But the question of sanctifying work is an important one. How do you and your, as the businesses you run, or the departments you are a part of, wherever you fit in the organizational hierarchy, how can you make your work holy? Can work even be holy? Are there kinds of work that God would just rule out and say, no, you really shouldn't be doing that? Or are most jobs okay? And in some way, it could be God-pleasing, both what we do and how we do it. And of course, integrating faith and work, you can't help but think of ethics. Ethics, doing work in a God-pleasing way. Fair weights and measures and scales, if you think back to some of the Old Testament scriptures. And for many people, I think about bringing their faith to work, that's really what it's about. For other people, it might be about expressing their faith, wanting other people to know there's a, a subset of this faith at work movement that I'll talk briefly about that's called BAM, Business as Mission. And those are people who believe that the workplace exists primarily as a mission field primarily as a mission field. Personally, I struggle a little bit if that's the only identity where it devalues the importance and reality of work in society and in God's economy. But for many people, they view the work as a mission field and through work is how they're going to witness the people and evangelize. So we have business ethics, we have vocation, calling, meaning, purpose, expression. And another part of faith at work is a sense of healing that, that uh, through 
work could be tough. We talked about it this morning, my remarks, as Hobbes would say, brutish, nasty, and short. Work is not always easy. And for many, their faith is a, a bomb on Gilead. It's what helps anger them, still their hearts, and to deal with some of the pain and challenges of the workplace. In fact, uh, I put these four together in a model I call a TIP, the integration profile, uh, in the four E's. These are four different ways, empirically, from my research, I found this is how people integrate their faith and work. And many people have a natural predisposition to one of those four spheres of domains. For many people, if you ask a barbecue or a cocktail party or a picnic or a dinner and say, well, when you think about bringing or taking your faith to work, what does that mean to you? And I've developed a, a psychometric scale with it probably that, that helps it find what our predisposition is. Not unlike Myers-Briggs or Strength Finders or other scales, you, we tend to have predispositions in life for certain things. Some people, it's all about being ethical at work. For other, experience is what I mean for work, for work as a calling. Do you experience your work just as a job to pay the rent, or is it something bigger than that? Enrichment is the devotional tending to the soul, the prayer time, the quiet time. An expression, both verbal or nonverbal, is how people might wish to communicate what they believe and why to others. So these are ways, and it might help as a typology, and of course we're all probably a little bit of a mix of these things, but to look in the mirror and say, well, gee, which, which way do I tend to think, now that I might have a vocabulary or a framework to think about how I integrate faith more? Where is my, where, where am I, and maybe where do I want to grow or challenge myself to get out of my, my first limited way of thinking? And through a Christian lens, I might add, all of these are profoundly theological and biblical. No one is rank order better or worse than the other. And the instrument we've developed, by the way, works for all faith traditions. So whether you're Jewish or Muslim or Hindu or whatever you believe or don't believe, it's a scale we have developed works for, for all different traditions. So let's talk about the context of the workplace, what it's, what it's like. Uh, and of course, some of you travel all around the world with your business. Others, you're mostly here and, and everything in between. Well, it is changing. Uh, the world is changing. Let me show a, uh, describe and then show a few things as an example of that. So in the, in the past, most of us, myself included, were masters in, at living a compartmentalized life. That's what we're trained to do, very much a sort of Western develop, development separated out mind, body, and spirit into three different categories. Uh, and at work in particular, there are three taboos. What were the three things you were never supposed to talk about at work? What's the third one? It's the juicy one. Sex, you got it. So, well, we, we, we all, now all companies talk about politics. Uh, they're taking issues and sides and underwriting, underwriting packs and lobbying and legislation. Um, all have policies on sex and sexual orientation and sexual conduct or misconduct within the business of society. And we don't all have to look at any TV show to know that these things aren't taboo to talk or think about. And religion now is emerging the scene. There was a time when polite people didn't talk about religion in, in public company. Well, that's changed. And even if someone is not religious, and many people describe themselves as spiritual but not religious, the reality is it's on people's minds. In fact, even in the Wall Street Journal, every day you will find stories that somehow touch on religion in Wall Street Journal. Some of the best stories. Uh, and not just reporting on ISIS or things like that. So many companies began to think, how do we think differently? And let me show you a little sort of brief historical analysis of the way I see how leading companies have changed and moved the needles with things that used to be taboo. So back in the 60s, what was the big issue? Race. And of course, it's still an issue. But in the 60s, there was extraordinary de facto, if not legalized racism in our country in many, many places. And people were told you could not have certain jobs. You could not be in certain lines of work. Well, enlightened companies began to think about that, and not just for legal reasons, but for moral reasons, changed that. And companies were really a big experimenting place for the laboratory, if you will, to say, well, we need to really develop race-friendly policies. We need to move past our history of racism. Now, to be sure, it was clumsy and awkward in the beginning, affirmative action programs we can all think about. Uh, but many of those were the beginnings of conversations to come up with better policies and practices. What was the issue of the 70s that was untouchable also, emotional, difficult, people didn't know what to talk about? Women. The failed equal rights amendment, you might remember that, gee, here's a concept, women should be paid the same amount as men. What a great idea. For the same work. Uh, 
and that women also will begin to be allowed to have positions they never would have thought of a client facing position or a senior executive role. Women too were beginning to be treated properly. And of course, from a faith perspective, all this is, is very logical. What was the issue in the 80s? Well, there I call it the family friendly generation. That's when companies, the family was no longer defined with, uh, with two parents, mom and dad, and 1.8 children. Uh, we began having mixed families, blended families, divorced families, single parents, single moms, single dads, and companies began developing flex time and daycare centers to accommodate these needs and allow people to come in late. Uh, and stay late, whatever it might need to be. And smart companies began to think about that. In the 90s, regardless of what your personal, religious, or political views are, the whole gender orientation question, uh, that still was a big issue. Uh, and companies began to move and change their policies on what to do and think about the LGBTQ community and how to respond to that. Companies tackled the issue. What happened in the 2000s, I would call that sort of the whole self-friendly, where enlightened companies began realizing the whole person comes to work with their problems, their worries, if their child is sick, that's on their mind, or something, if they're budget problems. They bring all that with them to work. And if you can help employees be more of themselves, be more authentic, more real, all the research is overwhelmingly clear that if you treat people holistically, they respond better. They're better employees. So where does that leave us for now? My, my research suggests that we're moving into what we might call the faith friendly as the next module, the next big social issue that people need to think about. And notice I'm not saying Christian friendly, or I'm not saying Jewish friendly, or fill in the bank, I'm saying faith friendly. And I'll talk a bit about, okay, let's talk about what do we mean by, by faith friendly. Well, first let's, let's step out of our zone for the minute. And I would say the same thing whether I'm here in, in, uh, in the beloved uh, far or go Moorhead or whether I'm back in Princeton or wherever I might be traveling. Faith has a lot of different faces. Many of you will probably recognize this if you read the small print. It's a Heathrow, Terminal 4, and it's a multi-faith prayer room. Or in Michigan, the Religious Reflections Room, the airport again. Or in Beijing, even Beijing has a prayer room. I was recently in Bangkok, and here it's the interesting, it's called a Muslim prayer room. It's not more open, it's very specific to their culture and context. You probably know some of these numbers, but pause and see the U.S. religions at a glance. So this is a profile, statistical profile in the U.S. Protestants still 51% of the population, Roman Catholics about 24%. Uh, the next big chunk is unaffiliated. You'll see the Jewish uh, percentage is very low, under 1%, or just a little below 1%, Muslim percent is growing, as we all know, uh, largely due to the immigration patterns. So uh, as, uh, as Dorothy once said in Wizard of Oz, we're, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> and at a global, the puzzle changes, the pie chart changes a little bit, if we think globally. So I'm really intrigued with the question of whether you're in a local small business, an SME of some sort, small medium-sized enterprise, or whether you're with a global publicly traded or privately held company, what's that look like for faith? Whose faith and how do I integrate it in ways that are productive and not destructive? And how do I do it in a way that's authentic for me, for you, whatever your worldview might be, how can we do it in a way that's authentic? So let's look at some of the issues or challenges or problems if you try to quote unquote bring faith at work. Let's be real candid. What are the issues that might cause disruption in the workplace, might cause pushback, might cause rejection, and the very wonderful thing that you're seeking to do might blow up in your face. So here are the about four or five main fears that I think people uh, are worried about when you say, we'd like to bring our faith to work. Well, one of the first things is that people think, well, proselytizing. You're trying to shove your religion down my throat, and I don't want to hear it. I didn't invite you to do it, and if you're going to bring faith to work, and that's what your agenda is, no thank you, I don't like it. And closely related to that is, is harassment, just like there's sexual harassment in the workplace, there's increasingly religious harassment. If you look at, by the way, the EEOC lawsuits and complaints that have gone forward, they've skyrocketed over the past decade. 
many people think incorrectly that most of those increased lawsuits are in compliance. Many think that it's about the overzealous Christian trying to convert an employee. And that's really not the case. Most of the Christians in the marketplace, at least based on the data, are actually very gentle. And they're not trying to be rude or obnoxious or um, uh, put pressure on people. They're just being themselves. The problem, most of the lawsuits now in complaints with the EEOC has to do with accommodation issues. And largely, it's minority religious traditions, mostly Muslims, who are realizing certain real, uh, legal appropriately, legal rights they have, and saying, you know what, I, I, I'm not being treated fairly. I have some rights, you have some obligations. And, that, and whether they're right or wrong is another story. But those are the questions that are now driving, driving concern in a lot of EEOC activity. Another concern is what will happen if one group forms in opposition to another. So if I let a Christian fellowship group get together that has sort of traditional views and doesn't believe in LGBTQ, uh, does that group have the, is that group going to rise up against the LGBT group where you can have these little fights between the special interest groups or employee networks? So, by the way, many companies have employee networks that are faith-based now. Notice I'm saying faith-based, not faith-friendly. So you can have a Christian fellowship group. You can have a, a Buddhist group. Have a Jewish group. Uh, Ford Motor Company have designed that in a clever way. If you believe in having employee networks, these business resource groups, uh, which many people will privately tell you that if they were starting a company from scratch, they probably would not do those programs anymore. But there's a lot of uh, the HR community has a lot invested in it, and it's really hard to undo those programs, even if they may have outlived their their initial noble purpose. Uh, they are now little fiefdoms that are that are hard to sometimes take apart. But there's a concern of, of what you do with it. Ford Motor Company is something called FIN, Ford Interfaith Network. Think of it almost as a holding company. And they've got about 15 different faith-based groups inside the company. So there's a Muslim group, a Christian group, a Jewish group, and, and on and on it goes. And the, the idea is they've created a, a parameter that they can play nicely in the sandbox by virtue of having the, the overarching network where everyone is a member of. Each group can meet on their own and do their own thing. Some would say that that has actually presented them, uh, prevented them from having labor unrest with some of the violence that has gone on uh, with the Muslim community, which, as you know, is very big in, in Detroit. Uh, that because of increased awareness, knowledge, and sensitivity to different religious traditions, uh, that they have avoided some of the um, unfortunate activities which have happened in other places. Another concern of conflicting force, if you quote unquote bring faith to work, is will, will there be religious favoritism? So you come to my Bible study, you come to my church, and I'll promote you. A certain quid pro quo might be operative. Uh, accommodation requests are a big issue. Wait, if you let one person do it, you have to let everybody do it. It's going to be a mess. It's going to unduly disrupt the business. It's just going to be a complete hassle. Why do we even want to go there? Uh, and of course, the big fear is all this will lead to, lead to, lead to litigation. Now, I think these are all legitimate uh, questions, but they need not be fears. And my research, both uh, qualitative and quantitative, and I did 15 years or so of studying this phenomenon of integrated faith and work, says that most of these, while important to think about, are red herrings. And most of these can be well managed, in fact, if not easily managed, just as other issues that were once sensitive in the marketplace, companies learned how to develop a language and a framework, like race, like gender, family issues, and so forth. So let's look at what some of the complementary resources might be. Let's look at the other side of the argument. Well, there's a lot of potential. Think whether we want to play defense or play offense. So, so uh, if you want to avoid negatives, that's one way to think of it, one reason you might want to do this. Well, the, the, my research suggests pretty strongly that if you create context in which companies can be faith friendly, where people can bring their whole self to work, assuming they play by certain guidelines and ground rules and, and civilized and respectful behavior in the office place, the actually will reduce problems, not cause problems. One of the companies I do work with, uh, they have a big, uh, a big uh, Muslim uh, workforce in one of their plants in Tennessee. Uh, another uh, company uh, next door to it, uh, Dell Computer, also the same big Muslim population. Uh, one of them has had industrial action, uh, Dell plant, the big strike and a lot of problems. The other plant did not. And the reason that we assessed that they didn't wasn't because their management was uh, uh, so much more clever, but their management had learned to be alert to the issues that go with a 
large Muslim population. And chaplains and other things which help address some of the issues and prevent them before they happen. So my, my experience suggests, my research suggests that if you put the topic on the table and talk about it in a respectful way, that actually you can have a healthier workplace and avoid the very problems that you're afraid of. By the way, one of the biggest obstacles to, uh, and Greg and I have talked about this a few times, not necessarily in your company, but another is one of the biggest obstacles to this question is usually the general counsel's office and the chief HR officer. Most of them think this is a really, really bad idea. And I understand that. They're trying to minimize risk and, and so forth. But many of them don't understand it and haven't really understood the, the flow side. There's some great possibilities that can come out of it. So here's some of the, just a few of the positives that you can glean from organizations that create space for, who legitimize the concept of faith and work. Well, as most of you will certainly know, the, one of the big metrics that companies look at are employee engagement scores. Are your employees really engaged? Not just are they satisfied, are they engaged? Have they bought into the mission? Well, for people who have faith, and I think earlier we talked about vocation and calling and meaning and purpose, for many of them, they're, they're very excited about it. They can be turned on to become more loyal to a company if they're engaged. And faith may often be the interpretive key for them to go down that road. And that's part of the meaning, meaning and purpose. Uh, I've also heard stories where companies who are intentionally faith friendly, intentionally allow people to bring their faith to work, that they become a magnet for high potential people. And as you all know, the war, the war on talent, the war for talent, trying to hire the best and brightest to attract them and to retain them, that that could be a differentiating characteristic. Let me think of another example. Let's say you're a single mom or, or you're married and you and your husband each have a job, a dual career couple, and you have begin to have children. So if you have an option for working with company A, which may have a daycare or subsidized daycare as one of your employee benefits, and company B doesn't do that, and all things being equal, which company are you going to be attracted to? Well, the one that might subsidize or help you with some of the realities of juggling family life and children with your careers. The same thing with faith. If some companies are told, no, I'm sorry, you need to shut down that part of yourself. We don't do that here. We don't allow that. And another company says, no, as long as you're respectful of others, fine. Come on in. You're probably going to go to the other place. Uh, one of the things which vexes me, I wish, uh, Faith, you might laugh, is I wish the research were more compelling. I'd like to think that people who self-describe as being religious would be much, much more ethical. Something uh, I call the human condition, uh, or uh, the theologians call the doctrine of sin, sin, which I believe is very democratically spread around society. Whether you're in the university world, the church world, the corporate world, politics, uh, uh, we are constantly reminded that we are a fallen people, myself included, and that we, we screw up daily. I'd like to think that if one were practicing their faith earnestly and carefully, uh, with intensity, that they would be more ethical. There, we've really yet to find any data that fully substantiates that. Although there is, there was one interesting study about 10 years ago that said that people who are active, it had to do with proximity. The more often you remembered and were reminded of your faith, then you would be much more ethical. But if you weren't consciously thinking of your faith, it became, it became background noise. And the group that you were most proximate to would then persuade you as to what you should or shouldn't do. Which is actually, a good argument for why we should develop practices and disciplines and habits to reinforce our faith and not just have it be a, a tick the box exercise that we do once or twice a week. And lastly, this whole, all the research says that holistic thinking is really what uh, makes employees more engaged, more loyal, more creative, and really at their best. And if you tell people that their faith is no longer, it's not in that category, that that's not part of what it means to be human, you really, you've left off, one has really left out a big opportunity, a big part of, of human reality. So I've been using this phrase, faith friendly, but let, let's put a little teeth on it. So first, uh, some of you might remember the, the uh, old uh, uh, scholastics, the, the early Christian scholars uh, were trying to describe the nature of God. It's such a big task, like how you describe something that's undescribable. They developed the via negativa and the via positiva. So the via negative is, well, what isn't God? Well, God's not evil, God's not bad, God's not nasty. And then you can begin to hesitatingly say what God is, uh, the positive attribute. So let's first say what's faith-friendly not. 
So faith friendly is not some, some Trojan horse, like wink, nod, I'm going to proselytize. Uh, to be sure, one should feel free to share one's faith. That's perfectly OK. But it's not uh, pretending to be something it's not. You're not turning the house into a company of worship. It's, you go to work to work, and your worship life is a private and personal matter and should be tended to outside of work, I would argue. Uh, and ultimately, faith-based says you're not privileging one particular tradition. Now, that's particularly important, I think, if you're a publicly traded company. The space of being a small, medium-sized enterprise, I think the, there's different models that could work there. A founder could say, look, I built this company uh, based on what are some of the values, based on a certain set of values that, for me, come out of the Christian tradition. You don't have to be a Christian to work here, but I want to let you know those are the values that animate and motivate and guide us, that help us understand what kind of company we want to be. So that space, I think that still could be faith-friendly. It's a delicate space. Because if I'm not a Christian and I walk in and I see that, then it's a question of do I really believe what I'm being told. Can I be promoted to be in the top ranks of this company if I don't go to the same church or have the same beliefs as, as the founder? In many companies, I think that's perfectly doable and you can make it happen. But it's an area to be sensitive of. Uh, when the asymmetric power exists in an organization, uh, things can have un unintended consequences can exist. So here is what I, what I think about when I say faith friendly. And to be sure, I'm not saying all faith traditions are true. <laughs> They're very different. And intellectually, arguably, you might say, well, they all can't be true. So which one is the truest? Which one most uh, closely approximates ultimate truth? That's perhaps one of the life's most important questions. That's not mine to adjudicate for others, but it's a really important conversation to have. But I think the God that, that I believe in is, is OK with challenges and is OK with people who think different things. It's, if the God is really the God of the whole universe that created everybody, even people I don't believe what they believe, it compels me at least to have a certain degree of respect that everybody is created in God's image. Complicated though that may be at times. So you see as you look through some of the, the bullet points here under faith friendly, what it is, it's an attempt to create space to give people permission for them to bring their faith to work. Of course you have to play nicely in the sandbox. I, I once was asked, uh, well if you if you really say bring your whole self to work, but what about the outlier? What about the, the nutcase? What about the extreme? And so we'll give you an example. And uh, I, I spent a lot of time in, in South Florida, and so we're near the islands, and some of you may know Santeria, that it's sort of a voodoo kind of religion. And that this religion practices something where one of the rituals is to take a chicken, hold it by its legs, cut its throat, catch the, the blood, and then drink the blood. And so let's say you've got a Jewish group that's doing a Torah Bible study in the conference room, and, or a Christian group that's having a Bible study, and, and then your Santeria folks come in and say, well, we'd like to do our ritual in the conference room. It seems free. I don't any reason they can't use it. Well, yeah, there's a few reasons you can't. Uh, and then, and then not just because of OSHA and, and things like that. <laughs> but, but it's a question of uh, beliefs versus behaviors. Beliefs versus behaviors. You have to play nice in the sandbox. So even if someone says, this is my truly held belief, I think I should act in a certain way or I should hate certain people, you're fine to believe that, but you can't behave that way. And that's one of the, to me, the simple ways to adjudicate using a little bit of common sense, the outlier or the person or the individual whose behavior may be uh, mean-spirited or actually harmful to others. So this idea of respect is a, it's a theme which, which comes through it all. Uh, as I study different companies, and, and I do a fair bit of advisory work increasingly with, uh, with large multinationals and, and other firms who are asking questions first, usually just about ethics, and often then it turns into faith. And, and often because of being on the long end of a lawsuit, companies saying, help me dig out of this hole. How should I structure our HR policies policies uh, with this question of religion. And I see uh, four different ways that companies tend to approach the faith at work integration question. <coughs> One strategy is to say, uh, I call it the faith avoiding group, and that's to say, man, I do not like this at all. I will only follow the minimum legal accommodation, but this is just trouble. It's going to be a rat's nest. The last thing I want is different people from different traditions bringing their faith to work. It's complicated enough as it is already. In fact, some of you might remember Henry Ford had that great quote, why is it that I get the whole person 
All I want is a set of hands. <laughs> wow. Yeah, in a way, in some ways, in the short run, that is a little bit easier. Uh, but in the long run, it's not. Or you might remember at Nine of Kant, the great uh, philosopher, uh, said that human beings should never be the means, they should be the ends. Human beings should never be the means, they should never be the ends. And he said that, that the means must be as pure as the ends. So that makes a case for the whole the whole person. So one way is faith away, where you try to shut it down. Well, the other is a bit different, I call faith-based. That's where one, it's a Christian company. That's a little complicated. I still don't quite know what the word means when it's a, an adjective, uh, be it a Jewish company or a Christian company. Uh, Bill Pollard, some of you will know, uh, the now retired chairman and CEO of the, the Service Master Company. Uh, and that company was often described as a, a Christian company. You might remember the four uh, principles they had, or the four uh, core values they had were to, number one was to honor God in all we do. Number two was to develop our people. Number three was best possible customer service. And number four was satisfactory profits and returns. And Bill always differentiated between those, those four goals. The first two he called ends goals. Ends goals. So that being to honor God and all we do is to develop our people, because he believed people were created in the image of God. And the second pair were means goals. Well, how do we do that? Well, we have to take really good care of our customers and our people, and we have to have satisfactory profits to reinvest in the business. And Bill was fond of saying that, you know, when I get to heaven, I don't think I'm going to see IBM there. I don't think I'm going to see GE or I'm not going to see Service Master. I'm going to see people. I'm going to see faces. So I, I've always smiled at think uh, I tend to be you know, a little cautious when the word Christian is used as an adjective. Uh, but as we know, we can think of companies like uh, Chick-fil-A and others that are uh, very forward and very front, uh, upfront about, hey, this is who we are. Uh, and we're a faith-based company. It, again, I would say that model is uh, an effective model if you're a small, medium-sized enterprise. But the bigger you are, the more complicated it gets, both for legal reasons as well as for talent and attraction of, of, of people. So the third model, and this is frankly where most companies are, and that's the, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So if you know this is going on, you know people are interested in faith and work. By the way, this whole thing is a movement, it's a phenomenon, it's a groundswell, it's not just one or two uh, people trying to think about this. Uh, and, and, and But the, the view is, I don't think I should go there. There's uh, one of the large publicly traded companies in uh, uh, the Twin Cities, I don't have permission to mention their name, one of their ex scholar technical committee members, who's a very committed Christian, was wanting to bring faith to work and help give permission for people and put policies and practice for that to happen. And he's on my advisory board, Chris, and asked, well, how can I help you, or what's going on with it? He said, you know, do you love your girlfriend? It, it's, it's on my list, but it's not on the top of my list right now. I'm going to have to use a lot of political capital to make it happen. And then I just don't know about that. So he was following the, you know, if, if it ain't broke, don't, don't fix it. The problem with that is sooner or later, there will be a lawsuit. Sooner or later, something embarrassing is going to happen. And you risk actually the whole thing being shut down. Uh, I, I've done some work, and still do for many years, I've done work with, with Deloitte through professional services. From they give me permission to tell the story. They had a situation a few years ago that a prayer chain uh, that some 900 people were a part of the, the uh, prayer chain. Uh, it was a Christian group. Uh, it never caused any problem or any issue. And it, uh, uh, although, unfortunately, one time they prayed for someone, a woman who um, had breast cancer. Uh, it was a nice prayer, except the woman didn't want anyone to know about it. And she was outraged. She was hurt and outraged. Even though it was good intention, it was a bad effect. It didn't even forget Kevin and all that for a minute. It was just an ill-advised thing. Um, she then made a complaint. The uh, general counsel, who happened to be an atheist and actually very angry at Christians and Christian worldviews, said, this is my chance to shut this thing down. And taking a sledgehammer to kill a mosquito, they closed down the whole prayer network, saying and the legal re reason was a misuse of company assets. Uh, that then caused a new problem because many of the people who were on the prayer network happened to be very senior partners. And they said, wait, this is ridiculous. It's the wrong solution. They asked me to come in and help them think about it. We put a task force together, spent about six months meeting and thinking and talking about this. Well, what's the appropriate thing to do in this company? Recognize the diversity of employees and they have offices in 60 different countries around the world. Uh, the task force was comprised of Catholics, Protestants, believing Jews, secular Jews, a Catholic, a Sikh, 
Muslim, and you know, essentially it was like the little United Nations. And we spent time getting to know each other and talking about what's important, what should this look like at work, how can we all feel honored and authentic, and not being told we're going to shut down who we are, and yet play nice in a sandbox. And I floated one of the meetings, this research I've done into faith friendly as a concept, and that became what they were all really enamored with. In fact, when we finally presented it to the CEO, uh, who happened to be uh, sort of a secular Jew, I think it's maybe a fair way to, to describe him, or he would describe himself that way, he said, this is the most thoughtful report I've seen on a sensitive issue ever. And the person who actually presented it was, we also had an atheist in the group, by the way, and it was the atheist who presented it. But this was beautiful. <laughs> so uh, they have, um, in as many words, adopted a faith-friendly policy. It's giving people permission as long as you play within certain parameters. Because obviously that was a mistake that that program made, and they had to change their policies and practices to make sure people understood that you could not violate confidences and so forth. Uh, and the last one we've been talking about is faith friendly. And that, that's the model that I would, as a general suggest for folks and organizations think about. Because then you're also you're in charge. It's the way you're, you, you define the terms, you're not in reaction mode, you're defining the outcome. So uh, just a couple of thoughts maybe if, if, if you're interested in this question, I assume you wouldn't be here for much if you weren't, but you're not nuts to be thinking this. And, and even though the demographics of this community are probably a bit more homogenous than the demographics of where I live uh, outside of here in New York, uh, asking these questions are really important questions, and they're not always easy ones. Uh, it takes a, a long time and a, a faithful process to find answers that work in your company culture, your corporate culture, your organization. And whether you're in charge of your company, or whether you're one of the players in the management team, or a rising employee, it's a worthwhile conversation to have with your organization to think about this and to be intentional and not just sort of flounder your way through it. Um, and just, you know, when I say you're not alone, this is happening not just in the US, but around the globe. Uh, look at Fortune Magazine, a cover story several years ago on God and Business. But with a journalist, a friend of mine, Mark Gunther, at the time he was a secular Jew, as he wrote the story. He interviewed people from about eight different traditions and wrote a story. By the end of the story, he became a practicing Jew. He rediscovered his own roots and faith. It was a beautiful thing. And, and he said they almost pulled the story a week before it came out because there was a lot of anxiety in the editorial room of doing, you know, super, uh, the Gospel of Man, right? Fortune Magazine doing a story on God, and they were very, very nervous about it. Well, they, luckily it was a, a slow news week, so they ran the story uh, and uh, bumped it off the cover. And it turns out that it ended up being the best selling issue of Fortune Magazine in the history of the magazine, as measured by newsstand sales. Extraordinary. And the emails, all the sort of the letters that came in, they were overwhelmingly positive. Only a few people saying, they didn't really talk about God and the spiritual they were. The overwhelming thrust of emails is, thank God you're finally talking about something I care about. Meaning, purpose, depth, vocation. So here are just a few things that, that uh, uh, prominent from different lenses of the business world, people are looking at this question. To be sure, they're critical, as they should be, critical reflections. Scholars are involved, like Faith and myself and several others. This is one of the hottest booming areas of research in the uh, Business Academy. Uh, the person on the right is a Nobel uh, Prize winner in economics, and he said the greatest uh, asset is, a, a, is a, a, the greatest contributor to growth in an egalitarian society is spiritual assets. He's a Russian Jewish immigrant. And here's some other text, just the titles to give flavor. People are thinking and studying this. So if we, this, this position we posed at the beginning, this, this question of faith and work, are they complementary resources, are they conflicting sources? Well, there's a great German word with all the good uh, German and Lutheran heritage in this room. We probably maybe you know the word, Jain. So, ja means nine, yes and no. So, of course, it could be either, right? It depends how you implement it. You can, if you can implement this in a way, it could be a disaster in your company, or you can implement it in a way that's refreshing and life-giving. I've tried to put down on the left-hand side the, the nay arguments, why you shouldn't do it, so the, the prosecuting attorney, if you will, and the why you should, or the defense attorney on the, the right-hand side of, of if you handle these issues the right way, some of the benefits you might have and or some of the problems you might avoid. You know, as an aside, the, uh, just thinking generationally, is, is, I think you know you now there are more millennials in the marketplace, I think the numbers just tipped than there are baby boomers. Uh, 
so all the dinosaurs here that are about to be taken over by the millennials, and I think of the students I have the gift of teaching every day, they're really interested in these questions. I mean, when I was there, I remember to touch this subject with a 10 foot pole. It's like, it just was not on my radar screen. Uh, I teach a class called Business Ethics and Modern Religious Thought. Business Ethics and Modern Religious Thought. And I, I talked to Howie about it before, and Greg's come and visited the class a few times and talked to students. And I look at it through the Abrahamic traditions. Remember, again, I'm a secular research university, so I, I have to have a bit of a wider tent. And, and frankly, that's appropriate. I have to with that. But I ask the question, what do these traditions have to do with ethics? And how do they shape and inform people's ethical attitudes and behaviors at work? Now, I would have thought there'd be about three people with a sign for the class. Uh, the past few years I've been teaching, I usually get about 25 students with a healthy weight list, but I, I cut the, the enrollments off at 25, so it could be interactive and I could get to know them, their names, their stories, and really the involvement in their, uh, their lives, more of a sort of Socratic uh, pedagogy and have deep conversations. Well, the religion department through which I teach the course uh, about a year ago said, would you please, please offer this as an open lecture, a normal Monday only lecture with uh, precepts or a teaching fellow student in the third hour. Uh, and I kind of forgot about it and until then I got this phone call to register just before the semester started. I had a big panic saying, have you heard of here? I said, no, what, who died? And they said, no, but you have 170 people who signed up for your course. <laughs> and let me be really clear, it's not because I'm a good teacher or anything. The students want to talk about this. They're really, really engaged. And then when they have different people, a Sabbath observant Jew who's an investment banker on Wall Street, when they have Greg Page come and talk about running cargo, when they have a Catholic come and talk who runs a, a, a PSEAG in New Jersey to come and talk about the things that, uh, that they tap into what shaped and informed their leadership and their ethics. You can hear a pin drop when the students do that. But they can finally hear role models other than Gordon Gecko. Uh, that, that can inspire them to want to to build something. Like Howard, he builds things and travels around the world and touches people through every business transaction. It's extraordinary. So one of my I don't know, pet missions is to restore business as a, as a noble calling that, that young men and women can go into and say, well, I can make a difference in the world. I don't have to work for a 501c3 or a charity or a nonprofit or a church. And if you're called to do that, please do that by all means. But for many uh, folks, they're not. And unfortunately, they're, they're given a message sometimes from the church. And unfortunately, that to be a really good Christian, you, you need to go into the ministry. Well, everyone's in the ministry the way I read it. The word minister just means to serve. Uh, there's no pain in ministry, that's a different function. That's not what I call it. I think I might have in the opening um, uh, a slide that uh, something called the Avoda Institute. And some of you can get an email from me, it'll either be on princeton.edu or or Abedah, and maybe it's a good way to draw this all to a close before any questions. Abedah is an old Hebrew word uh, that when I was, uh, when I left the corporate world uh, after 16 years and was in seminary, I was slogging through my, my MDiv and, and, and the, the, the union where I got the PhD uh, in ethics. But when I was studying Hebrew, I came across this world where it's one of the few times that I've had a light bulb go off, like, aha, I had an epiphany. And that, this word avodah you'll find throughout the Old Testament, it's still in modern Hebrew. It's spelled A V O D A H, A V O D A H. Sometimes it's translated to mean work, as a work in the fields, labor, a job, to work. Sometimes it's translated to mean uh, worship, as worshiping Yahweh, the King of Kings. And the third translation of the root of this word is to serve. So to work. To worship, to serve. We all remember that great verse uh, from Joshua as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, Abodah, the Lord. That's really what my whole mission is about. How do we think about how do we help leaders, men, women, and also young folks who are going into the marketplace start their life thinking about these questions and not waiting like I did till much too late to start thinking about them. How can our work be a form of worship, of honoring God and yet serving neighbor? So yeah, these are just some open questions I'll leave you with. You can read them yourself, but uh, what are you gonna do with this question we put out there? Do you privatize it or do you engage it? One person, uh, Steve Reinen, once wanted me to do some research at the time was the uh, chairman and CEO of PepsiCo. We never did it, but he was curious. If he wanted to find out the utility of this. Could being faith friendly give you a competitive advantage? Independent of the, just the beauty and appropriateness of being faith friendly. He was curious what the commercial bottom line might be. So here's my closing New Yorker cartoon. It's a bunch of, uh, you can't read it in the back, a bunch of uh, gold diggers, gold miners, and 
scruffy blows with their beards, hoping to strike the rich, and one says to the other, well, of course I hope to find gold, but my real goal is spiritual growth and inner peace. <laughs> so with that, I wish you spiritual growth and inner peace. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we have just a few minutes for any burning questions that you might have for David. You threw out a quick nugget there about your mission in your store business as a noble cause. Can you talk a little more to that topic? Yeah. You know, not just because of 2008 and, and some of the damage that was done to the global economic system by, by uh, some participants in the global economic system, uh, but in general, I think business really can be another problem. It could be one of the biggest ways, when it's done well, to lift people out of poverty. It's one of the biggest ways people can have an identity, a sense of a purpose and value in life that they're contributing to society. It's a, one of the opportunities to influence and shape people, to help people that are hurt. I mean, any, let's face it, many homes and families that are broken, there could be an abuse situation or just loneliness, uh, mental illnesses, all sorts of problems go on at, at home. And sometimes when we work, is that, that could be the healthiest place that person is for eight or 10 hours of their life. Uh, one of the CEOs that worked with us uh, is, does a lot of manufacturing, and he said, you know, it's the darkest thing, people come to work early before they have to clock in and they sort of hover a bit afterwards. So why do you think it is? I thought they just wanted to be right out. He said it's because they have a community there. And it's for some, it's the only safe community they have in life. So work has, a, has an intrinsic value. Uh, sort of we'll make goods and services that we need. This microphone I'm holding, this, this water we drink out of, the, the food, there's, there's, there's real purposes for things that make life better for people. Uh, and then there's this sort of metaphysical or uh, sort of extrinsic value that comes from work and healthy work communities. I mean, I don't know you because I've lived in different places in the world. I have, I have worked for companies that were more holy than some churches I was a member of. And I'm not trying to whitewash the problems because there's a lot of screwed up companies too. There's a lot of bad ventures and uh, the fallenness happens everywhere. But, but I, I hold on to this extraordinary capacity business has more so than governments and NGOs to make a big difference in the world, and particularly dealing in dangerous countries and difficult places. So, and I think that's where it's really, really exciting because it's so tough. It's so tough. And I would rather have a face of Christ in some of those places than not. Uh, All right. In the interest of respecting your time, it's now 12.59, so I actually have to let you go. But thank you so much for coming today. Thank you to the many of you that came in the morning and have hanged out with us. Thank you, my friend and mentor, David, for uh, flying out and uh, experiencing a little of the spring weather. It's, um, well, it's, and by the way, I, can I just make a, say something and embarrass you, so plug yours. Faith is a very gifted and talented person. I'm just really very happy with this community where I have so many good friends that have developed over the years that you're part of the, the fixture of it now. And uh, you and Chaz and little Imara, and it's a, a great privilege to keep working with you on some of our research projects. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> We're taking a break for the summer, but we'll be back at it on September the 9th with Maury Lanning as our speaker. We shall see you then. Please have a... And Bill Marcio. And Bill